Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats and silence all electronic devices. The program will begin shortly. Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to Boston and the 57th Annual Meeting of the Psychonomic Society. Appreciate all the effort you've taken getting here and those of you that are still working through time zone changes, the effort to stay awake. We have over 2,500 researchers from over 30 countries attending this meeting over the and over the next few days, you will be in the proximity of such sites and attractions as the Boston Commons, Fannell Hall, Bunker Hill, and the USS Constitution, as well as the beautiful Back Bay area just out your back door. I hope that you are able to explore and enjoy Boston while you're here, but not so very much that you miss a lot of psychonomics. As the chair of the Psychonomic Society's governing board, it is my honor and privilege to serve our field. It is incredible to realize the breadth of this organization, not only in topical scope, but also in geographical scope. We hope that these meetings will serve to strengthen and increase the ties and collaborations among experimental and cognitive psychologists around the world. We have some awards to present, and we're gonna introduce the keynote speaker in just a moment. But before that, I wanna take just a few moments to highlight some of the Society's recent accomplishments, some of which you've been reading about up there. As of today, the membership in the Society has increased to over 3,700 members, which is almost double from 2014. And importantly, many of those members, the new ones, are students, which bodes really well for the future of our Society. In May, we held our second annual, or second international meeting of the Psychonomic Society in Granada, Spain, with almost 1,000 attendees. And many of the attendees remarked that it was one of the best conferences they've ever attended. In June, our second leading edge workshop, where the Society awards up to $50,000 to hold a special workshop, a symposium at the annual meeting, and to create a special issue in one of our journals, was held in Chicago. It was called The Evolutionary and Psychological Significance of Play, and it attracted experts from around the world. Be sure to check out their symposium in this room on Saturday at 1.30. Gary Lupian and Rob Goldstone's proposal, Beyond the Lab, Using Big Data to Discover Principles of Cognition, has been selected for the 2017 Leading Edge Workshop, and it's gonna be held sometime in the midsummer in Madison, Wisconsin. Continuing to strengthen our international representation and collaboration, the Society held its first collaborative symposium at the International Conference on Memory in Budapest, Hungary. Um, that was in July. Led by Almut Hupach, the symposium on the ever-changing engram towards an integrated understanding of long-term memory dynamics was one of the most well-attended symposium at the conference. And please take a moment to explore our website to learn more to, about us and what's going on and to take advantage of numerous opportunities, including um, nominating your students and colleagues for awards, applying for future Leading Edge workshops and collaborative symposia, and other exciting initiatives. Front and center at the website, you're gonna find our vibrant featured content section, which is edited by Steve Lewandowski. He and his amazing editorials team have posted their 200th piece as of now, which is remarkable. Comments and participation in ongoing discussions are very much welcomed, and you can join Steve and his team at a special poster that will be held every evening at the poster sessions in the Heinz Convention Center during this conference. So these are just a few highlights of the many things that have been going on in the society in recent years. As I previously mentioned, our meeting in Granada was a huge success. And this was in no part, no small part, due to <laughs> Teresa Bajo's incredible tireless commitment to it. Many of you know Teresa here, but I'm not sure all of you knew that she was wearing three hats for the society in the last year. She wore one as a member of the governing board, as the chair of the International Presence Committee, and also as the chair of the scientific committee for the Granada meeting, which as I said, was a raging success. Teresa, we are so grateful for your extraordinary commitment to the society and specifically for the Granada meeting that we would like to recognize you um, and your efforts formally. Could you please come up and receive a token of our appreciation?
Thank you again, Teresa, for your incredible efforts in making that meeting successful. And we'll be looking forward to another one in 2018 in Amsterdam. So as you probably know, we launched our new open access journal, Cognitive Research, Principles and Implications, in partnership with Springer and Nature last year. Please provide a warm welcome to Editor-in-Chief, Jeremy Wolf, who's gonna give us an update on that journal's first year. Yep, uh, uh, woohoo! <laughs> this is very exciting. Um, so a year ago, I stood on, uh, on a similar stage in Chicago and announced the birth of Cognitive Research Principles and Implications, or creepy as we call it, in the nicest sort of way. That being a year ago, today I'm here to, uh, to celebrate our first birthday. Well, actually, that's uh, the baby of Talia Konkel and George Alvarez, but we are here to celebrate and report on uh, creepy at age one. And let me tell you a couple of things about how we're doing. Uh, as was our intent, the new journal is a high quality, peer reviewed, open access journal. It's the first open access, fully open access journal of the Psychonomics Society. Um, and after a year, we are, we're doing quite nicely. Uh, the 100th submission for 2016 came in just before the meeting. Uh, as many of you will know, for new journals, that's really quite a, uh, quite a respectable number. But it does not get you off the hook. You should still get that paper in that you were promising me. Um, or even if you weren't promising me. Um, there's a 50% chance that we'll reject it, but not your paper, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, and by the end of the year, we will have published uh, probably about 30 30 papers, which again, for a brand new journal, is, um, is actually quite good. Um, not only are we publishing papers, we're publishing interesting papers. Dave Strayer had a, uh, a, an interesting paper on the dangers of your car uh, just this week. Um, we have a special issue coming forward on education, which will include some articles of this general sort. We have, uh, actually we have a small industry in articles about what they call football in Europe, um, including one on FIFA referees that got a lot of notice in the, uh, in the press. Um, so, what do we actually want from you here? Uh, we want you to read the journal. Now that we are publishing articles, you should definitely read it to your children. It will help them sleep. <laughs> we want you to cite the journal. By citing, citing the journal is, is, is one of those metrics that will give the journal the, uh, the weight that a psychonomics journal um, should have. Um, and what we really want from you, of course, is, is your papers, your um, your manuscripts. Let me remind you or tell you for the first time that the, the particular area for this journal is use-inspired basic research. The idea um, is that you can imagine a two-by-two two where you have on the x-axis relevant, somebody's reading my gray box, I can tell. Um, <laughs> Relevance for immediate application on one axis, relevant to the development of basic knowledge on the other, and we're looking for that sweet spot in the upper right. Problems that you got from the world, brought into the lab, studied with the techniques of our science, maybe eventually it will be applied. This is not an applied journal. We want the basic science that's gonna solve problems in the real world. If you have work like that, we wanna see it. Um, you could also think about work like that a little more broadly if you are interested in writing a review article that basically says use inspired basic research on the topic of your choice, please talk to me. Send me an email. I actually have to go to a wedding by tomorrow lunchtime, so I'll be hard to find here. But we're very interested in people who want to survey the area of use-inspired basic research. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank the very talented editorial board that has got us through the first year. 
Um, and again, read us, cite us, and write for us, and I hope I'm back next year with even better news. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And I just want to emphasize that he was being modest, that it's incredible how well that's done in the first year in terms of the number of submissions and already having those papers. Very unusual, so we're really excited. Okay, um, let's see. I think I've lost my place. Okay, sorry. I'd like to end my particular remarks here um, by acknowledging my fellow colleagues on the governing board. If you could please stand. It's a pleasure working with you as outstanding scientists and colleagues. dedicated and caring individuals and a lot of fun to boot. I also want to thank our executive director, Lou Chimet. If you could stand up. He's been with us for almost three years now. Um, thank you so much for helping us realize the vision of our strategic planning. And Lou officially became a, a staff member directly of the Psychonomic Society this past year. So now on to awards. I'd like to call up to the podium Laura Carlson, who was the chair of our awards committee, and she's going to present the 2016 Early Career Awards. OK, good evening. I'd like to acknowledge the good work of the awards committee, whose members are Jason Art, Teresa Bajo, John Henderson, Patty Reeder Lorenz, and Lael Scholler. So on behalf of this committee, I want to present these awards that recognize significant scientific contributions made early in a career that served to raise the visibility of not only our best scientists, but also our fields as a whole. The first recipient of the Psychonomic Society 2016 Early Career Award is Barak Chandra Sakharan from the University of Texas at Austin. His research examines the neurocognitive sources of individual differences in speech processing. The goal of his work is to develop optimized and neurobiologically informed training approaches for second language learning, learning impairments, and auditory processing de deficits. Please join me in congratulating Barack. The next recipient of the Psychonomic Society 2016 Early Career Award is the winner of the Stephen Yantis Early Career Award, Christopher Donkin from the University of New South Wales. Chris's research uses quantitative methods, including Bayesian techniques, to develop, test, and compare theoretical accounts of working memory, category learning, perceptual identification, cognitive architecture, and both simple and complex decision making. Please join me in congratulating Christopher. The next recipient of the Psychonomic Society 2016 Early Career Award is Kimberly Fenn from Michigan State. Kim's research focuses broadly on memory consolidation and skill acquisition with a focus on the effect of sleep and sleep deprivation on memory stability and false memory formation. She also investigates the extent to which fitness impacts memory. Please join me in congratulating Kim. Our final 2016 Early Career Award recipient is Jennifer Trueblood from Vanderbilt University. Jennifer's research takes a joint experimental and computational modeling approach to the study of human judgment, decision making, and reasoning. Her work examines how people make decisions when faced with multiple alternatives and in changing environments. Please join me in congratulating Jennifer. Congratulations to all the recipients of this high honor. Thank you, Laura. 
that was on my notes, but I was going to do it anyway. Thank you very much, and to, congratulations to all of our 2016 Early Career Awards. Our future is in good hands with these up-and-coming scientists, truly. So congratulations. So new this year, we've invited the Women in Cognitive Science to present the Psychonomic Society and Women in Cognitive Science Travel and Networking Award for junior scientists, those recipients for 2016. I'd like to invite Natasha Tokowitz to come to the stage to make that presentation. Uh, no, I think I'm okay. I'm sure. Uh, maybe you're younger yeah. than I am. <laughs> thank you, Kathleen. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to give these awards here. Um, as you know, pre presenting at professional meetings, such as the annual meeting of the Psychonomic Society, is an important way for individuals to become known in the professional community and to develop collaborative relationships with other professionals in the field. Given the relatively short time frame of the 10-year clock, it's essential that individuals begin to appear at professional meetings early in their careers. Be because of that, um, we give these awards so that Graduate students, postdocs, and assistant professors can come to this meeting and network with senior scientists. So to get this award, uh, these winners have written uh, networking plans to network with senior scientists in their fields. So with that said, I would like to present first the Psychonomic Society and Women in Cognitive Science Travel and Networking Award for junior scientists to Mirta Faber, who is a postdoc at the University of Notre Dame, and Angela Grant, who is a PhD candidate at Penn State University. Congratulations. And next, I would like to present the Women in Cognitive Science Travel and Networking Award for Junior Scientists, funded by the National Science Foundation. These awards are being presented to Kathleen Arnold, who is a postdoc at Duke University, and Heather Dial, who is a postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin. Congratulations to all of our Travel and Networking Award winners. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Natasha. Finally, I want to thank all of you for coming to Boston and to share your dis and discuss research at this meeting. We hope that you'll enjoy the wonderful program, interact with your colleagues from around the world, and have a chance to take advantage of being in Boston. I would now like to invite Lynn Reeder to the podium to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Lynn. And while she's coming, I'd just like to say a quick thank you to Lynn, who is graduating off of the governing board and for all of her incredible service in the past six years. So thank you, Lynn. Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Roberta Klatsky as this year's keynote address speaker. Dr. Klatsky is the Charles J. Queenan Jr. Professor of Psychology at Carnegie Mellon University, where she's also on the faculty in the Human Computer Interaction Institute and the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition. Her training is as broad as her affiliations and her interests. She received her bachelor's degree in mathematics, graduating with distinction and high honors from the University of Michigan. She received her doctorate from Stanford, where she studied human memory with Dick Atkinson. From there, she joined the faculty at UC Santa Barbara and further broadened her interests. Most people who study perception focus on hearing or vision, but she went into an almost unknown area, haptic, also known as touch perception, and also pioneered important applied topics such as how the blind navigate their environment. 
Her research in this field is just one example of Bobby's breadth of interests and important contributions in so many domains. Her research investigates perception, spatial thinking and action from the perspective of multiple modalities, sensory and symbolic, in real and virtual environments. Klatsky's basic research has been applied to telemanipulation, image-guided surgery, GPS-based navigation aids for the blind, and neural rehabilitation. She's authored more than 250 articles and chapters and authored or edited seven books. After rising to full professor at Santa Barbara, Carnegie Mellon was very fortunate to snatch her away. Not only did we get an incredibly talented and exciting experimentalist, we also got a generous and smart administrator. She served as department head for a decade while she continued to broaden her research topics. To give you an idea of her energy, she's the only CMU psychology department head who volunteered to teach while also running the department. During my 40 years in that department, no one before her or after her has done that. While conducting important innovative technical work, Klatsky also managed to find time to serve her department, university, and the scientific community both nationally and internationally. She has served on countless panels that span different scientific disciplines, as well as serve all major psychological sciences societies, including being the chair of the governing board of the Psychonomics Society. Likewise, she has served on countless editorial boards while still managing to be highly productive in her own right. Professor Klatsky has received numerous honors, too many to mention all of them here. Among these, she has won the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Research Award and the Kurt Kafka Medal. She has been awarded fellow status in many scientific groups and has been invited to be a visiting scholar in many places, including the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, a visiting scientist at Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tuvenim, Germany, an honorary Hans Fischer Senior Fellow and honorary ambassador at the Technical University of Munich, as well as a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Finally, if all these achievements were not enough, Bobby Klatsky is also quite impressive outside the academic. She is a fabulous classical pianist, has become fluent in German, late in life, I might add, a great cook, and does beautiful knitting, and so on. She's also an avid runner, running almost every day. Given that she is also a really nice person, it's no wonder that she has been a pleasure and an inspiration to have known her all these years. Dr. Klatsky's talk this evening is entitled Perception and Action in the Wild. I know we are going to love this talk. Thank you. <laughs> so, up here. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be giving this talk. I would really like to thank the Society for inviting me, and um, I'm just delighted to be here. I had, as you might imagine, a little bit of angst about this uh, solemn um, obligation, so uh, Jeremy Wolf really set me straight. He said, first of all, make it short. <laughs> you're, you're the only thing between your audience and the reception. Second of all, he said, please don't present any triple interactions. <laughs> I think this is just, just wonderful advice and what you would expect from uh, someone with Jeremy's uh, wisdom and, and humor. So uh, I will try to follow it. Uh, I begin with the scenario that we all recognize it's, uh, I won't even mention psychonomics, so I would just, you know, you're on the airplane and people say, um, what do you do? Hmm, what's that? Here is my classic response. <laughs> 
But I do have a classic response, and the response is that cognitive science is research that's based, it's the focused on fundamental human abilities, basic and applied. And very early on in my career, I had the very good fortune to serve on a panel that was uh, studying what happened to students who were in graduate school and did not seek to uh, pursue an academic trajectory and went into what, what that time was called industry. And it had quite a pejorative flavor to it. And at that time, I became um, uh, introduced to Earl Aloisi's law, not all applied science need be boring, not all basic science need be useless. This may sound a little cynical, but I think it actually reflects somewhat of the tenor of the times in the post-behaviorist, post-war years, when psychology was indeed struggling to develop a basic science, and I'm, I, I, uh, I honor and uh, have great reverence for purely basic uh, science, don't get me wrong, but uh, without thinking about uh, what we now call translation. I think we've come a long way from that, and, uh, Jeremy's creepy uh, new journal is a good example of that. So I don't have a law. Um, a person with a bag over her head should never have a law, I don't think. But my heuristic is embedding basic science in applied science is both exciting and useful. And my own approach has uh, been to try to alter perception in the service of facilitating action and um, cognition. So what is this endeavor and how does it work? Here's a mishmash of some of the ways that one might see this uh, emerging, a uh, tangible graphics on what seems to be a glass plate, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Vibration for touch, which is a technology that seems to keep reappearing, has been around for at least uh, 30, 40 years. Um, uh, immersing people so as to get them to move in ways they might not move. Uh, haptic feedback for teleoperation, and uh, visual depiction of touch, and so on. So does it work? Do these interventions or these alterations of touch work? Uh, well, let's see. First of all, altered perception starts with natural perception. So here we have a person who is moving their vocal apparatus in such a way as to change the sound pressure in the local environment. And that pressure wave is going to impinge on the ear of the listener. And eventually, it's going to cause some kind of revolution in the cochlea. And that's going to be sensory data in the, in the natural channel. And it's going to be processed as speech uh, by the pathways ascending to the brain and beyond within the brain. So one form of altered perception is, in fact, what's called sensory substitution. And in this particular scenario, the natural channel is simply replaced, or not so simply replaced, I might add, with a new target channel because there's no sensory data in the source channel. So we take the physical data that would be in the source channel and convert it to something else and now send it off to upstream task-related processing in that new target channel. And uh, an example of this is anyone who's ever seen a sound spectrogram. In fact, it's a visual realization of that sound pre pressure wave, as is the wave itself. And you can ask, does it work? Well, let's see. In fact, my first application efforts uh, started in UCSB were aids for blind using sensory substitution. And I'll give you two scenarios. One is uh, taking uh, line drawings, converting them to raised line drawings, and putting them under the hands of people uh, so that they could feel and understand what was depicted. The second one, uh, which Lynn alluded to, was uh, using uh, spatial sound to guide blind people and inform them about the layout around them and using uh, binaural headphones and a computer program that uh, can present the classical cues, the time difference and the intensity difference to the ears so that the sound seems to come from somewhere else. So let's look at the first of these. This is the application of 2D graphics for the blind. Uh, here our intersensory uh, conversion is we take these luminance edges arrayed in space, which would normally be processed by the visual system, and V1 loves those edges as we know and change them to tactual edges. Uh, you can do this by punching on a, a, a receptive surface, or now we have actually a bubble a thermo, thermofax type display that makes this a lot easier. But anyway, we send them on to touch to uh, explore. 
So what's the problem here? The problem is it doesn't work. Uh, without vision, people really can't identify these raised line objects, and you can explore them and explore them and explore them, and it's quite frustrating, actually. Uh, so here's uh, some data from studies of ours, 35% um, uh, correct after almost two minutes of exploration. And uh, what's the problem? The problem is that we can send it on to the target channel, but that doesn't mean the target channel can process the information we're presenting. In fact, uh, in my naivete when I started this endeavor, I thought somehow there was something like middle level vision in the tactual channel, and there's not. In fact, what you end up with is a process of spatiotemporal integration, which we don't seem to have a good central processor for. So if you do the same thing with visual aperture uh, viewing and control it nicely, you'll discover you go down to the same low level of recognition. Uh, it's not a peripheral limitation. This is a, a paper I just love by Astrid Kapper's uh, group and wish I had done it. She simply had people draw these things after they had explored them. So they feel the key, they draw the key, and they look at it and say, I'll be darned, it's a key. Why didn't I know that? So in fact, we know that we can take in the peripheral uh, stimulus. A more recent version of this is to uh, create uh, friction-based uh, alterations in otherwise um, smooth glass plates and use those to portray textures and edges. And uh, this is a beautiful device by uh, Ed Colgate and Mike Peshkin's group at Northwestern. This is the T-pad Fire. They have the later versions of it and uh, actually have their own company, Tandis. So you feel on the plate and you run into friction variations that represent edges. Now, here is the problem with that. Uh, under normal touch, and uh, David Rosenbaum did a beautiful study to uh, show this, as you touch a line, you get an array of pressure variation under your finger. And so local contact variation tells you where you should go next. It's the most natural thing in the world to keep um, going. However, on a glass plate display, the technology is such that the entire display is either on or off. You don't know that because it only occurs when you feel locally, but in fact, the whole thing is either high friction or low friction. And so that means that there's a uniform surface under your fingertip. You have no array information to tell you where to go next. Does it matter? Yeah. Here's someone trying to pick up an edge. This is data from my own lab on a friction-based display, and they actually know that the bottom edge is there and oriented relative to the frontal plane, and they're just trying to pick up the second edge there, the angle, and this is just part of a person's exploration. Uh, it, it's frustrating, again, because you get lost and don't know where to go. So on the right, we see a comparison. If you look at this edge with vision, you simply say, oh yeah, okay, I know what that angle is. A tangible surface made of sandpaper, and you'll be able to follow it quite quickly, but either a friction-based display or one that vibrates depending on where you are locally, the problem is the same. It's still a smooth glass plate, and you're very, very hard put to uh, deal with it. So that was my first foray into applications, and I, uh, and I learned a lot from the original tangible graphics and more recently from the glass plate displays. I kind of got revisited with the same fundamental challenge although in this case, uh, peripherally induced. My second application was with Jack Loomis, uh, who had this brilliant idea long before GPS was a commonplace, that we could actually uh, put uh, uh, a local map in a computer, know where people were by something like GPS, and then present them with information about their environment uh, from uh, the uh, uh, what they were feeling, and so here we have the person in their environment, this is actually working, and now she hears, I'm the bus stop, I'm the bus stop, I'm over here, and because of the differential arrival time and intensity to the two ears, that seems to be coming from a virtual bus stop that actually is just really resident in the computer. So uh, we had two goals for this work. One was to tell people what their surroundings were like. So if you stand still in the telephone booth, oh, that boy is that archaic, isn't it? A telephone booth, oh my goodness. Anyway, a telephone booth calls to you and a bus stop calls to you, you would know where they were in space. The second goal was just to get people to move in space so that they would hit a target that they wanted to get to. So uh, that's, this is basically the chart. We take these visual spatial cues that would normally be in our, in our environment and we have wonderful retinal cues to azimuth and we have very good depth perception within limits. 
and instead we convert them to this auditory spatial world that we all know that we can hear with binaural hearing and we pass it on to upstream task related processing. Whoops, okay, here's the first problem uh, that we discovered when we began to work on this. In fact, your auditory angle, angle perception is really excellent, but your auditory distance perception is very, very compressive. So on the left here, we have what the person would see as say they were walking forward. They could actually hear what angle is coming from a time one. They could hear what angle is coming from a time two. They might be able to do some internal triangulation and they would know where the source was or simply know where it was simply from the directional cues at each point. The actual situation is unfortunately rather sad. The source is here, but on the first line of hearing, it gets pulled in some fraction to here. When you get to the second location, it seems to be now pulled in along this to something here. So one has the bizarre illusion that the tree that was talking to you was in fact moving along with you along your walk. And so this creates a rather unstable world and our efforts to teach people about location were for this reason uh, sadly compromised. However, the guidance system of this works just fine because all you do is point yourself in the direction of the sound and just keep walking. The sound changes its angle at some point in time and you will in fact change your angle and walk along with it. And we got people to walk in open fields along quite complex paths. And the trick is they don't have to know where they are, they just, if the sound changes direction, they go along with it and when it finally seems to be above their head, they stop. Uh, this is just to show you that not everything is done so easily. This is actually using um, binaural cues but without having a compass on your head to be able to know your instantaneous head position. So you have to keep walking for the GPS to actually get a signal as to what it thinks your head direction is. And this is just to show you that in fact this is not a trivial task in, on, in other circumstances. So my early application efforts taught me some very interesting things, the most fundamental one being that sensory transformation they may violate expectations. Learning layout from sound was a failure uh, due to auditory space perception, uh, errors, particularly distance, but guidance by homing to sound worked even in the face of these uh, very fundamental distance errors. Raised edge graphics without vision failed, due to central processing limitations, but in fact, when you add a smooth surface, you had peripheral limitations as well. But even beyond that, I actually became kind of a glutton for doing these use-directed research uh, and found that applied research and basic science could really work together, and even the failures were tremendously interesting. I also learned that you're going to have to learn more about the technical world because many of the challenges uh, lie in technical solutions that we may not have. So my early application research evolved to some other models and in particular I turned from sensory substitution to sensory augmentation. And this took various forms I'll tell you about, um, hopefully uh, not in <laughs> too lengthy uh, uh, discussion. Uh, augmenting surgery with embedded images with uh, ultrasound and more recently optical coherence tomography, uh, using feedback to motivate motor rehabilitation, and adding vibrotactile signals to semantics to facilitate young children's story uh, listening and reading. So, wow, this is complicated, but the top is just my old model, sensory um, substitution. You don't have a natural channel, you divert by converting to a target channel and send it all upstream. Augmentation, the big difference is that now we keep the natural channel around, but we add some new stuff in the target channel, which by the way may be the same as the source channel, but it's new stuff. They get sent together somewhere, we hope they get integrated together and sent on for upstream task related processing. So this is the augmentation um, scenario. Let's see what that looks like for surgery. A lot of surgery today is done with uh, the aid of images, particularly ultrasound. They're used very commonly to, uh, of course, examine a fetus and, and um, to remove amniotic fluid. They're also used very commonly to insert tick lines, peripheral catheters going to the heart to drip uh, medicine to people who have uh, severe infections. And in the most common scenario, you have a surgeon who is working somewhere but looking at an ultrasound image that is displaced to some screen, which is remote. And our name for this scenario is ex-situ imaging. 
And it creates a mismatch between the location of the perception and the location of the action. So the question is, could you actually use augmented reality to, to bring these two things together into the same spatial milieu? Uh, I happened to discover this delicious problem, and that's actually the word that I used when I first discovered it. I smacked my lips and I said, delicious? Because, in fact, my colleague George Stetton had developed a wonderful device to accomplish this trick of augmented reality. And it's simple optics. You have an ultrasound transducer that's actually measuring the, the sound, and that's uh, in this device here. You have a screen, which normally would be your remote screen, but in this case, it's actually sent to a screen in the handle of the device. Then you have the psychologist's great friend, the half-silvered mirror. The half-silvered mirror sends light rays up to the eye of the viewer by reflection, who also looks down through the mirror to see the patient. Everything is registered and integrated into the same field. And the illusion is that you seem to see the ultrasound image actually floating in the patient. Uh, whenever I see this picture, I have to laugh because um, this was actually an ultrasound that was converted from a veterinary ultrasound. And it broke down at one time, and we had to send it away. And it was taking a long time to be corrected. I said, we could call the repair place and make mooing sounds over the uh, telephone in the, in the hope that they might move it all along a little bit faster. Uh, so. What's the difference between the conventional in-situ imaging and this augmented reality? Well, on the left, we see this person looking here and cutting or poking there. And there's a, any cognitive scientist can tell you there's a lot going on here. You have rescaling, you have mental rotation, uh, and uh, so there are some complicated processes. The in-situ device simply places this illusory image right in the body. If you look at the cross-section of a vein, you see the cross-section of a vein and know where to put your pick line. And it's sort of like picking up an olive at a cocktail party on the end of a toothpick. There's not, you can become instantaneously the surgeon that's poking in the right place. Well, maybe not. But in any case, something close to that idea. So uh, with Bing Wu and George, uh, we began looking at the effects of in situ and ex situ in our first uh, work. Was, uh, we went out <laughs> and became the Tupperware champions of uh, Pittsburgh. We bought lots of little Tupperware jars, filled them with milky fluid and put beads in them. Had people uh, look at the beads with an ultrasound and presented it to them in one of two scenarios. Either on a remote screen, which we call the ex situ situation, and in these screens, one typically sees a metric with some kind of uh, centimeter markers, and we would put centimeter markers down there for people to know what a centimeter was so they didn't have any problem with the metric. Or directly in situ, where we would see the target in its, presumably, its registered location, although it doesn't really exist there. What exists there is what's being imaged by the ultrasound. So we used two tasks. One was to tell us where the target was by pointing, and the other was directing um, action to the target uh, by guiding a needle. So here's the localization task. People pointed to what they thought the target was from, by uh, setting a pointer on the rim of our Tupperware bucket. And they were imaging it either in situ or ex situ. And by triangulating for multiple pointing uh, actions, we could figure out where they represented the target location to be. And these data are pretty straightforward. We see it here the true target depth, here the perceived depth, the diagonal is ground truth. One of these lines, this is this one, is looking directly into the bucket. It has no milky fluid. You just see the bead and point at it, and people are quite good. With the in-situ display, there's absolutely no difference from that performance. They simply point to it. It's that good. And in the ex-situ display, they have a kind of uh, consistent shallowness that they think that it's been pulled toward them. And we did several studies to figure out what the source of that shallowness is. Some of it might just come from um, underestimating how much you're poking in when you're actually pushing with the ultrasound probe. And some of it appears to be cognitive in origin. But that's not so important. The point is that it's there. You don't see the target in its true location. So now let's see what happens if you were actually trying to put a pick line toward what you were imaging. This is the task where people actually guided a needle to the perceived target location through the top of the bucket. 
And at a certain point, they can actually see the echo from their new needle in the ultrasound plane. So the, that starts around here, about four centimeters deep for this target. So they actually begin to see the needle here. But here's the deal. When they're doing it with the in-situ display, they simply aim in the right direction. And basically, these are just different people in the average go toward where they perceive the target to be, which is true. In the other situation, remember, they perceived it as too shallow, and you can see their first directions are, in fact, pointing toward, oh, sorry, uh, to go, now I have to go back. How do I do that? Ah, good. Going, um, they're pointing high, and then when they get to the point where they see that, in fact, that they are high, they have the oh oh response and now they're going to descend downward towards the target. Unfortunately, this would really, if you had tissue that you could afford to get rid of, uh, say in a breast biopsy, you would cut through excess tissue. In the case of a vein, in fact, you'll miss the vein. And the statistics on first stick misses are staggeringly high uh, in the literature. So in fact, this is a very real problem in the placement of thick lines with the conventional ultrasound. Now, to make sure you're awake, I'll tell you about the next thing that we did, which was uh, the rod in the box. So what you do is you have your ultrasound transducer, you have a physical box, and you pull it along and push it along and pull it along and push it along. As you do it, you expose, through the tracker, you expose a virtual rod inside the box. So if you're doing this with an in-situ display, as you pull along, you'll see right below your probe, you'll see the cross-section of the rod. So you just see it in the box at its right location, and as you pull along, you just see it move. With the exit to display, you pull and you push, but what you see is on a remote display, you see your cross-section going up and down. But it's in a different location. So now our task was set a test rod so that it matched the pitch, yaw, or both of the um, rod that was in the box. So here is what one of those trials looks like. Note that this is a pitched and yawed. Uh, so a top view, this is what you're seeing is the yaw. The side view, this is what you're seeing the pitch. We're going to draw the transducer across the rod, and we're going to see what the consequences there are for the display. So I hope everybody's ready here. They're very cute. So as you push or pull, you should know that, in fact, the rod is uh, tilted in a particular pitch and yawed in a particular direction. Uh, the short story is that people were very good at this with the in-situ display, really quite good. In the ex-situ display, they not only made systematic deviations but they, in their orientation, but they had these odd flips where they flipped the direction in which the rod was. And this is because the task is so demanding, they couldn't remember whether they were pushing or pulling as the rod changed its direction. So if I pull in this direction and it goes down, it's pitched toward me. But if I think that I was going in that direction, it'll be pitched the other way. And then we had a surprisingly large number of these reversals, which are simply cognitive overload. The tag that you have as to which direction you were moving is, no, is not available to you because of the difficulty of the task. Now, if you think that's hard, this is a weird object in a box. It's still in the box, and I'll help you out a little bit. This is, we did this with 2D and 3D. So you're pulling your transducer along in this direction, and the first thing you see is the projection of this on the screen, which is this little bar there. Then you come forward, and you'll see two tubes, because this is where you are here, and now you see the two tubes on the left. As you go further, all of a sudden, this edge will emerge with the tube beside it. You get the idea? You keep going in, you'll get to the second edge, and then finally you'll end up with the last little edge here. So we had people match a test object after exploring these objects in the box. They did 2D, they did the 3D version of them. It's very, very cognitively demanding, but to our surprise, people could do it quite well when they were actually in situ. That is, they saw what they were, they saw the cross-section they were looking at as they pushed and pulled. When they were doing it uh, on a remote screen, as you can imagine, it broke down quite quickly. Uh, the nice thing about this is it tells you that an exit to display might be useful to actually tell you about the shapes of objects that are beneath the skin, tumors and the like, just by exploring with your probe. 
Uh, more recently, we've been extending this work to a different kind of imagery called optical coherence tomography, which is very commonly used in eye surgery. It's very, uh, it, it does only five uh, millimeters or so of tissue, but at very high resolution, and it actually creates a voxel so you can scan it in different directions. And uh, this on the left is our, uh, in our vision of how this might be embedded under a microscope by actually showing a surgeon an OCT image in situ under the microscope. And on the right, we actually see this. Uh, this is an OCT image in a cow's eye. <laughs> and so the OCT has been, is of the cow's eye, has been placed down in the cow's eye, registered exactly as it should be, although not seen in this case um, uh, through a microscope. So this raises a very interesting basic question. If we want to place an OCT image down under the eye in any um, orientation so that people can see uh, the, what they want, uh, the structures they want to operate on, can surgeons see slanted things under the microscope? This turns out to be a very non-trivial question, both for perception and for optics. Microscopes are made to have focus at one depth. When you slant something, you violate that. You now have things in front of behind the depth of focus plane. But because these devices are really good, you can still see, even though they're not quite on the focal plane, you can see in front of and behind them. But in fact, the magnification factor, as it turns out, is different in front and behind. So you have an anisotropic magnification factor. Add to that the fact that the microscopes make essentially an orthographic projection where everything seems to be very far away from you in terms of how your eyes focus, but near, very near to you in terms of where you seem to think that it is. You have many violations of the standard depth cues. Both the monocular cues and the stereo cues are in fact distorted. So we set out to ask whether surgeons could see slant under the microscope. To do this, we decided to develop a stimulus that would eliminate the, the uh, conventional 2D cues. Just to go back one, sorry. We have these 2D cues to, from the textural gradient. We decided to get rid of those with our stimulus and actually just have stereo cues. And this is uh, the first order approximation that we did was this uh, particular kind of image, which looks like a fractal and is a fractal. And in fact, it constitutes what people call 1 over F noise. That means that the power in the uh, frequency spectrum uh, goes off with the frequency. And this characterizes many natural images that we see in the world. The problem is if you tilt that particular image, you're going to get a statistical gradient due to clumping, uh, uh, statistical clumping. So we added another transformation that got rid of the, which really distorted the low frequency part of the spectrum so that the clumping went away. And now, within the limits of how well you can actually print the darn thing, you can tilt it and the statistics remain the same all over the image. So you can't tell, we hope, from gradient cues. Here's our control, uh, just a very nice uh, stimulus with lots of perspective, although under the microscope, that perspective will be distorted. And in fact, for those who like free fusion, this is uh, the stereo pair for one of these images. And uh, if you can, in fact, fuse it, you should be able to see tilt because it does, in fact, have uh, stereo properties. And it's bottom in slanted with 30 degree slant. So here's our data. We had people look at um, the, our novel stimulus in stereo, our novel stimulus in mono, and the control stimulus tiles. And if they are good at, this is, this is the proportion that they even know it's tilted at all. This is the, their success at, if they do say it's tilted, do they know what direction it's tilted in uh, for cardinal directions? And you can see this clustering up here is that people are very good at this with the tile which has lots of perspective, and with our new rendered control, uh, our new rendered stimulus with a stereo cues. But if we look at it with monocular cues only, they cluster around the chance on both dimensions. And so we did, in fact, succeed in constructing a stimulus that would isolate stereo cues so we could study it under the microscope. Believe it or not, that took a number of years of work. But we actually went on to do this under the microscope. And my joke is, if you ever work with an engineer, you'll work with a motor. In this case, we had two motors. 
One of these is to push the stimulus up and down so we can uh, put it in the subject's own depth of focus properly. And the other one is a pitch rotation motor so we can tilt the darn thing and ask people to tell us whether they think it's tilted. Uh, this on the right are data from a conventional adaptive threshold task where you just basically try to get people to tell whether it's tilted or flat. And you see what's the minimum uh, tilt that they can uh, slant, I should say, that they can handle. And here we see the tile stimuli are in fact a pretty uh, nice low threshold that's about what you might expect for uh, a stimulus of this type um, without magnification. Our novel stimulus hits the bar very nicely, but of course when you look at it monocularly, uh, this is in fact, the threshold is much higher. You can ask if it has no gradient cues, how can people even tell it's slanted? And the answer is it's an accommodation cue. At a certain point, it, you, when you tilt it enough, the differential accommodation across the field will tell you something about the slant. So that's a, a, a completely extraneous cue, but it does give you a cue to slant. So thresholds tell us that surgeons could see whether something was slanted under the microscope from stereo cues. And we went on to ask whether you can match a tool, which is the kind of thing that a surgeon actually has to do. They have to do no more than know that we're showing them a slanted image. They have to be able to match their tool to the slant. So we built this beautiful tool and uh, tracked it with a leap motion tracker and actually have people put it under the microscope and adjust it so that it would match the slant of the surface that they see. And this is their performance. The blue is ground truth and the red is a very good subject. I show you a very good subject because not everybody can do this. Stereo is notoriously fickle and even though we pretest our uh, subjects for stereo acuity, it turns out they can't necessarily see stereo fast enough or under the microscopic viewing conditions. But enough people can, quite a few of them, to make us optimistic about surgeons being able to do it. So you can see slant under the microscope. You can match a tool to slant. How about OCT data? We're just finishing our tests of this, but uh, this is the cornea of the eye viewed with um, OCT. Down below it is the diagram of the cornea. This is the kind of stimulus we use. We took a, something out of the section here and masked it so there wasn't a nice uh, perspective cue when it was tilted and showed it to people with our tool matching task. And indeed, most of our subjects, again, are able to match the tool to the slant, even of corneal tissue, which is not optimized for stereo vision. It's just whatever God is giving us with the cornea. So I learned a lot from my first and uh, ongoing augmented uh, reality surgery. I developed experimental support for a real device that displays in situ ultrasound. It led to many basic insights into the negative effects of even spatial, small spatial displacements of the goals of, of action from perception. We actually went as far as doing clinical trials and showed that nurses at bedside could use the device to insert catheters. We developed a new kind of stereo cue that we think might have wider use. And we now have results that support the use of embedded OCT in eye surgery. Okay, uh, let me just give you a flavor for a couple of more tasks that we've done. One is a different model in which you augment diabolically by adding distorted information and send it on to task-related processing. And what does this look like? Well, <laughs> what we're trying to do is deal with populations of stroke victims who are known to have severe and a traumatic brain injury who are known to have severe limitations in their ability to bend limbs, whether it's pinching or pulling their fingers apart or adducting and abducting their arm. And uh, what we did, decided to do was to take advantage of, of the uh, known um, uh, noise in our kinesthetic mapping to external space and lie to people about what they were actually doing with their limbs. And so this little diagram shows sort of the fictive nature of this, the person is actually bending 20, but we tell them they're only doing 10 because in fact their limitations, they've decided that 10 is what they can do. Uh, here are some real experimental data where we had people freely produce forces that we called one through five, and we showed them a little visual feedback. And over the course of the experiment, we actually lied to them and made them have to work harder in order to get the same visual feedback. 
When we distorted the feedback, they, mar they marched right along with the feedback in terms of their effort, both in distance and in force. And even on interpolated trials where there was no vision, in fact, a five became a bigger five at the, after the distortion than before it. So we were able to show that, in fact, these kinds of distortions will move people along. And these are multiple just noticeable di differences. A just noticeable difference is what you can detect when you have two things side by side and are weighing them against one another. Here, people are weighing against their memory of what happened earlier in the experiment. And we can go way beyond one JND, in fact, to two or more JNDs over an experiment. And if you ask people at the end, well, do you think that it was you know, any harder or easier to work at the end of the experiment? They say, maybe I got a little tired. I don't know, it seemed about the same. So they generally do not detect the fact that they've been led along the garden path of distortion. Uh, so we actually did a larger study of stroke patients with pincher grasp. This is a very common problem where people can't move their fingers apart enough or put them together enough. And these were people who were well beyond their Botox and rehab treatment and were basically in steady state with impairments in uh, grasping. And so we decided with this little, we have a two robot system that pushes against their fingers and uh, resisting forces in one direction or the other, and they have to pinch or uh, open their fingers in order to perform. And Bambi Brewer, uh, whose doctoral thesis this was, had this wonderful idea of making it into a game. So she made it into a hangman game where they had to pick a, uh, a letter and the um, vowels were placed on the outside of both closing and opening. Those are the things that people kind of want, and so you have them work harder. But in fact, over the course of the experiment, they had to move more in order to get the same letters that earlier they had gotten with a, very sm with, with a much smaller movement. And so we asked whether they would, in fact, and we started them out with what they said was their maximum opening or closing of their fingers, and then moved them from there. And this is what happens to them. This is uh, over a session. We see people in the distorted group. You say you have to move further for that vowel, although they don't know it, and they move further for the vowel. When there's, on sessions where there's no distortion, they don't move uh, any differently, and they don't pick things further away. But the distortion is certainly moving them along. The really nice news is that at the end of, this, of six weeks of this treatment, they were well, in fact, outside of the original li uh, limits that they had walked in the door with. So is there another model we might pursue? Well, there is, but we've all seen enough boxes and arrows, so I'll just go straight to the ch chase and talk about what I've been doing for sensory augmentation with uh, Disney Research um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And this is with Ali Israr and a wonderful a group of students. And we've been actually asking whether touch can be a kind of meaning for aiding children's um, reading. So uh, our first experiment just asked, is there a semantics of touch that we can map onto language? So we had people, in fact, adjust three parameters of a vibrotactile display. The uh, stimulus onset asynchrony, asynchrony, so the interval between vibrations, the duration of, of each pulse, and its intensity. So here's a person who is supposedly setting a, something to, to match, I feel heavy rain on me. And so they have a little slider for number of drops, which is really the SOA. They have a little slider for the size of the drops and a little slider for the force. And then at the end of each setting, they get to try it. And when they think it's a good heavy rain, they stop and they say, that's where my heavy rain is. So we can look at the distribution of these parameters for a whole bunch of semantic events. And this is some of the more dense data you're ever going to see. But in fact, each row is a language phrase, and then what we have are the settings of the different parameters. If there is a curve, it means that in fact, a, a parameter setting had a peak, and that was important to them. If it's flat, it means they didn't care much about that parameter. And if they stack up at one end of the, or the other, it means that our device limitations are being tested quite uh, that's as, as well as we can do. But in fact, we did get nice discernible settings for our various um, uh, phrases, and we were able even to create these little families. So here's the rain family in terms of our three parameter setting, and you can conceive of having mist and kind of knowing where to set mist in all of this in terms of uh, the parameters by just interpolation. So that was our first effort, was to show that there is a semantics of very simple vibrotactile touch, and uh, this is uh, then took on to children's reading. So here is the vibrotactile stimulator. 
uh, embedded in Mickey Mouse hands on the back of a conventional tablet display. And this is a reader reading, and the sentences come up on the display. So because we love rain, all of our stories, in fact, have rain in them. So she says, as a brave explorer, I love walking in the jungle. Even when it's raining, rain won't stop me. And at the same time, the device is going bloop, bloop, bloop to give her the drops on her hands. So uh, we had a, uh, embedded feel effects in uh, some of the sentences and not in others and within the same story and it's all counterbalanced and so these are in fact the effects of having a feel effect versus no effect for the very same sentence. And in fact, you can see that comprehension scores actually improved for the sentences that had the feel effects with them and uh, so did memory and there's a big enjoyment factor. Kids like the feel effects on their hands. We took this to younger uh, readers with story listening. And uh, here we had matching and mismatching uh, feel effects. And we asked, if, can this kids this age even understand the semantics of these feel effects? So we gave them matching and mismatching feel effects and asked them how nicely they went together. And they had a little scale of happy faces to say how well they went together. And this is, uh, these graphs are just the proportion as you adjust uh, the, the proportion of kids that have to accept it in order to say it's accepted uh, for the matching and mismatching, you can see that the cumulative proportion for matching and mismatching at four is the same. They think everything is great, it all goes together really swell, and uh, they don't care if you're poking them and saying it's rain or whether you're dripping on them and saying it's rain. By five years, they have clearly differentiated matching and mismatching feel effects, and by six years, in fact, they've even pulled apart so that at the most um, loose criterion, they're well above. Um, and so uh, they do get the sense that, they, that these feelings and the semantics of the story go together. Now when you take the five and six year olds and you go over to comprehension, again, the sentences with the feel effects are comprehended better than the non-feel effects. And so this is for story um, listening. I could go on, there's more. I have had the great fortune to do lots of great, uh, uh, have like great collaboratives, great fun and, and, and projects, um, augmenting interaction forces from surgery. I talked about this morning to the tactile research group and uh, that is uh, an exciting possibility of using uh, surgical environments like the eye where you just can't feel forces and making them available by magnification, teleoperation with magnetic levitation feedback, uh, recently with Ming Lin and her group at North Carolina, acoustical rendering. Um, and I continue with uh, Ed Colgate's group on friction-based rendering, but now for texture rather than for pattern. And uh, I have yet another project with a camera-mounted device with vibrotactile feedback. So I could talk about all of those, but I won't. I'll stop here because I remember what Jeremy said. You are the barrier between the audience and the reception. So I only want to, again, uh, thank the society uh, for inviting me to talk here. And uh, I, if I've left a collaborator out, I sincerely apologize. I have had the great uh, fortune to work with many, many uh, people. And uh, I appreciate the doors they've opened up to me in terms of the delicious problems that perception and action can offer. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby, for just an awesome, awesome talk. Really wonderful. And we would like to thank her for giving us her talk by providing this lovely glass of water. And now, uh, everyone, the uh, meeting is open. Please go join us in the room outside, I don't know what it's called, but you'll find the wine and the munchies, and thank you all very much. Thank you.